Die mai interesa acum. I'd like to uh, I'd like to open this meeting and welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, I'd also like to, to uh, I would also entertain a motion. It's been requested that we perhaps uh, move our agenda and take item 10, which is probably why most of you are here tonight, and move it to uh, agenda item one, which means we would discuss and act on that one first. I'll make that motion that we move uh, agenda item 10. And I'll second it. Okay, a motion by Britt and seconded by Dawn. Do we have any uh, questions, members of the board, or discussions on this motion? Any from the public? If not, we'll call for the vote, Madam Secretary. Oops. Hmm. Thank you. District 2. Yes. District 3. District 5. five. Yes. District 6. Yes. And District 7. Yes. 5 4, none against. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item, item, uh, the first item on, on our agenda will be request for proposals as well as Form 470 was advertised for the Internet and WAN services. After pro proposals were received and evaluated, an, an item was placed on the agenda for a prior board meeting to award a contract to the highest scoring process. A tabulation sheet of the final scoring was also attached to the agenda item and placed on LPS's website. After the tabulation sheet had been placed online, LPS has realized that it had inserted incorrect pricing data into the formula used to calculate the original scores. Staff has gone back and corrected the error, correcting the price information. I would, uh, and, and I know there are three or four uh, vendors at least that, that, that um, um, submitted pricing, and uh, I would submit those of you who are here and, and, and would like to, to address the board and, and the public, uh, I would like to allow each one of you, uh, say, four minutes to do so. Justin? Mr. President, I move that we award the contract for Internet services to Cox, Louisiana Telecommunications and the contract for WAN services to Hunt Communications. And I'll second that. Okay. A motion that we award Cox the, uh, help me out, uh, adjust, the one of them is the Internet. I'm sorry. That we award the contract for Internet services to Cox, Louisiana Telecom, and the WAN services to Hunt Communications. Okay, thank you very much for the motion. We have a second, Dawn, you second? And so now we have a motion and a second, so we have something to comment on. Are there any, any comments, first of all, from any members of the board at this time? I wish to make a comment, but I reserve the right to make mine at the end. Any other comments or questions from members of the board? Any other comments or, or uh, questions from any members of the public? You're welcome at this time if you want to. Sir, you seem like you want to. You, you may. You just go to the uh, podium over there, push the mic until the light turns green, give us your name and the company you're with. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. My name is Emmett Soul. It's like the Soul issue. Lafayette High School. From a long time ago, I live in Lake Charles. I'm with the Stockwell Siebert Law Firm there, and I represent Detail Communications. I appreciate the opportunity to come here today on what really has been somewhat short notice uh, for all of us. We got uh, the agenda only last evening about 5 o'clock, and I really didn't see it till about 9, but be that as it may, we're here. Travis Franks, who is the, de the uh, Detail representative, is here likewise with me. Uh, as you are aware, I feel certain the uh, this process of the bid for these two RFPs has gone through three different variations as I appreciate it. The first two times, Detail was a successful bidder. Uh, the second time, Detail was a successful bidder, and this time it has lost out for Internet services to Cox and for the WAN services to Hunt Communications. Uh, part of this uh, I think that's taken place has to do 
with the interpretation that detail made of the RFP provision having to do with the term of the contracts that were to be uh, awarded by the uh, board for these two different uh, projects. Uh, in one instance, it says they want a three-year uh, contract with two voluntary uh, one-year extensions, and the next sentence just about uh, says that it's a three-year contract. And as a result, there was some pricing information that was provided by uh, detail that now we have been, uh, we understand, has been uh, uh, disregarded, so to speak. And in fact, what's taken place is that the pricing on a three-year contract has been taken and put back into the same Excel uh, spreadsheet or model used by the staff to co to do its scoring, and now we are where we are, and that is a detail is not the successful bidder for either one of these projects after having been uh, the successful bidder twice before. Uh, so I, I, what we want to do is just explain why we're here and why, to some extent, we're disappointed uh, that the contracts are being it's being recommended that the contracts be issued to other to other bidders. Uh, I have asked for, and I have received a, uh, an explanation uh, today from counsel for the school board, uh, Mr. Alvarez, that the same uh, model of scoring was used, and I am satisfied, as is detailed, that that was done. Uh, and so what, again, we understand is that the three-year price was put into the model and it spit out a different number, scoring number for detail, and it was not awarded the contract. But uh, we believe that the information that we gave was satisfactory for the uh, contracts, both of them, to be awarded to detail. Uh, the, there were two different prices, as I appreciate it, that were given by detail. One was a five-year price that included two one-year extensions, and the other was a three-year price. And the three-year price was used, and it resulted in what we have today. Uh, what we don't understand also is that there was a, not a, as I appreciate it, it's not being considered to be a formal bid protest made by Hunt Communications. Hunt just asked the staff, asked the board, to please take a look at this again and asked that detail make a response which was done. Uh, I think uh, 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 Travis is the one that sent the response in. So there was no formal protest made by Hunt Communications and we were given an opportunity and we did respond and say uh, to the staff uh, that, that here's what we did and why we did it and why we think we ought to be awarded these contracts. Uh, we have never received a response to that. Uh, we have not made a formal bid uh, protest uh, because we're not at that stage yet. There's been no, no uh, we're, we're, this process is moving along at a different, uh, a different administrative uh, process than uh, would allow us necessarily to make that if we were going to, and, and detail uh, certainly appreciates all of the uh, of its relationship with the Lafayette Parish School System. Most definitely uh, appreciates the opportunity to do business with the Lafayette Parish School System. One of the things that uh, we do not understand also is that our bids for both of these projects, both RFPs, were made on a fixed price. In our opinion, at least we gave a fixed price. Hunt Communications, in one instance, as I appreciate what they have, uh, what they've presented in their bid to the uh, to the staff and ultimately to the board did not include some fees that may well be charged and so it could be and in our opinion uh, it may well be <laughs> that its price is not a final price and therefore its price is inconsistent with the RFP also and how it comes to be the successful bidder on the WAN project is uh, is is, uh, uh, is something of course that gives us some uh, concern, uh, especially considering the fact that detail has been the successful bidder twice. Uh, we uh, again appreciate the opportunity. We would ask, I understand, uh, because I've had a couple of conversations with Mr. Alvarez, 
uh, that, that the board is under some uh, significant time constraints because of the possibility of some federal funding. Uh, and we want to be as sensitive to that as, as possible. Detail does, and detail intends to be uh, sensitive to that. And yet, it would like this work, uh, as you might well expect, uh, and believes that its, uh, its, its bid uh, met the test of the RFP and that it should be awarded both contracts as was done as, as was done on two prior occasions, as I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if I've used up my four minutes. I can, as somebody said, talking is my business, so I can keep doing this for a while, but uh, I probably used up all my four minutes. But thank you very much for your consideration, and we respectfully request that the board uh, issue the contracts uh, to detail rather than uh, as has been recommended to the board. Thank you, sir. Someone told me that th today was uh, unofficially be nice to lawyers day, so I wasn't going to press you too hard on you for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other members from any or any other members of the audience would like to um, address this board? Yes, sir. Same thing. Come up to the podium, state your name, who you're with, and if you will, uh, try to uh, limit your remarks to about four minutes. I'm assuming the mic's on. It's Robert A. Robertson. I'm with the Allen & Gooch Law Firm. I go by Tony. I represent Hunt. We, we don't believe it's that complicated. We believe that um, there was simply a calculation error made. The, um, the request for proposal specifically provides the, t the conditions with regards to the terms uh, that must be submitted for bid, and it was a three-year term with a possible two-year extension. Um, and what had happened in this case, unfortunately, Detail submitted one that had a five-year term with a two-year extension, which was not within the parameters of the request for proposal. That was just missed initially when the calculations were performed. They went back, looked at it, picked up the correct number because Detail, of course, did include a three-year number with a two-year term. When they picked up the, new, the correct number, they recalculated and Hunt was selected rightly as the lowest um, bidder or proposer with regard to the WAN portion of the request for proposal. Uh, we agree with the recommendations that have been submitted to the board and request that the board uh, proceed accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Geez, uh, I offered you four minutes and you gave me two of them back. <laughs> yes, sir. Maybe I can beat that two minutes. Uh, my name is Bradley Pipes, and I uh, do represent Cox. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you guys. Um, we do feel, we, first of all, we appreciate the award of the uh, Internet Services, and we do feel that clearly we were the lowest bidder in, uh, in all of the renditions. We, uh, we were disappointed not to win the WAN Services. Um, you know, after review of the, the um, bids, we, uh, we feel like we were the lowest cost provider with our best and final offer. But, um, you know, understand that you guys have a decision to make and, and have to make it quickly. But, uh, again, we just want to say thank you and uh, look forward to doing business with you. Thank you. A anyone else in the audience would like to address the council? Uh, Dawn, I'm going to I'm going to ask I, I want to read something into the record. I'm going to ask that you um, beg of your indulgence to run this meeting quote unquote. I'm going to go to the podium and I want to read something into the record. OK, thank you. Tell me what I have to do. Limit him to four minutes. You can limit him to four minutes. Please state your name and you're limited to four minutes. Yes, I'm Tommy Augel. I'm I represent the uh, District 2 in the uh, school board division, and uh, uh, I'm the former mayor of Karen Crow. And as such, uh, over the years, although it's been a while, I've uh, had many disagreements with uh, with the city of Lafayette and some of the uh, uh, programs that they've come up with, and w one of which I remember long long ago. They used to refer to us as the small towns, 
And I asked the mayor at that time, who's, who's now deceased, I said, Mayor, why don't you call us area municipalities instead of the small towns? Uh, it, it has a better ring. Uh, but that, nonetheless, in this instance, uh, I'm not here to, uh, to argue with, uh, with the Lafayette or the Lafayette utilities, but I, I want to read this into the, uh, into the minutes of the meeting. Uh, <coughs> Lafayette Consolidated Government, of course, which is the whole parish, it's not just the city anymore. Uh, Lafayette Parish, the Lafayette Parish voters are the same voters that, that we represent, the school board members that represent Lafayette Consolidated Government. And as such, I think the public expects that we, that we should work together whenever possible. For example, for many decades, the Lafayette utility system has provided an electric service to the school board at rates n lower than normal commercial rates, saving Lafayette Parish over $75,000 a year. Lafayette Utility has also provided extra services to help the school system in emergencies. Lafayette Utilities has been providing internet and WAN services to our system since 2002. Direct comments provided by the Lafayette Parish staff indicate that Lafayette School Board that, that they have been pleased with Lafayette Utilities Services responsiveness. The current 209 contract between Lafayette Parish School System and LUS was initially for three years plus two more three-year extensions upon mutual agreement. This means that there is a remaining extension which could go through 2018. This recent overhaul solicitation process for internet and WAN service has been plagued with confusion, question, and doubt. The first solicitation was unadvertised even to the current vendor, plus it included virtually no detail for a vendor to base a proposal. When suggestions were raised to develop a more carefully crafted solicitation, the school board staff suggested that any delay in making the initial award would jeopardize E-rate funding. Such has not been the case. The second solicitation was in the form of an advertised request for proposal, which while far more substantive, contained numerous question marks concerning its objectivity. The RFP defined a scoring metric that was very broad and imprecise. They are listed as follows, cost of eligible services, Internet, 45 points. WAN, 45 points. There was no further breakdown in the scoring process that would have been used to evaluate the proposals, even though there were re requests for multiple proposals and speeds in the RFP. Unless some vendor had additional information, it could not know how to properly prepare the proposal. Experience in K-12 realm for public schools. The Internet was 35 points and the WAN was worth 20 points. Further definition in the RFP emphasized that the number of students served statewide would be an important consideration. This means that a system such as LUS that can only serve Lafayette Parish would be at a great disadvantage as compared to vendors with greater statewide service territories. Internet and WAN services are standard services used by many businesses and educational institutions, not just public schools. Technical merit, the Internet score was a possible of 20 points and WAN was 35 points. The RFP also specified a preference for underground lines versus overhead lines due to local exposure to hurricanes. Even though the school board staff, when asked, was not aware of any hurricane-related damage to overhead lines that disrupted the restoration of school activity. In addition, Lafayette Utility System showed that underground lines suffered higher number of cuts due to various construction activities such as compared to the far fewer overhead line cuts. In other words, back holes digging for sewer lines, water lines, telephone lines, they cut the cable m underground a whole lot more than squirrels bite them overground. This means that any system with overhead lines already in place, like LUS, would be artificially disadvantaged compared to companies with solely underground lines. Actually, the school, Lafayette Parish School System did not give any point value for the true technical merit or solution of any vendor. Even though the Lafayette Parish School System RFP requested information on items such as guarantee of service, network design, and system monitoring, no technical points were given to any of these items. Therefore, a bidder whose solution was more robust than that of another vendor did not receive any, bit, any benefit of that in scoring or the proposals. Curiously, the RFP evaluation contained a more granular point scoring breakdown than those provided to the vendors. Providing such scoring details in advance would have helped vendors provide a more targeted proposal. In addition, the Lafayette Parish School System staff placed a considerable amount of weight on receiving 10 gigabits per second of service 
at 41 school sites and 5 gigabits per second at five schools, even though usage statistics at LPSS show that the entire system uses a maximum of less than 3 gigabytes per second. That, that one was a tough one. By, by, rec by requesting bids on 10 gigabits of service, and I think that's speed, I'm not sure, but, uh, but 10 gigabytes, th the price of 10 gigabytes today is a lot more expensive than the price of 10 gigabits three or four or five years from now, when the school will really need them. We don't need them now. An, an uh, analogy th that comes to my mind is when I first bought an iPhone several years ago, it was $400. I bought one for my granddaughter the other day. You know how much the iPhone cost? Same iPhone, 99 cents. As, we, as technology becomes more and more advanced, the price of these becomes less and less. So why force us to p pay today for 10 gigabits when we only using, when we're actually using less than one? And, and I understand that in the future we may need it, but certainly not now, and I don't think we should have it to be pay paying for it right now. It would be a waste of critical school board resources to pay a premium for a speed that is not yet needed, especially when the cost to receive such speeds tends to drop each year. It is a further distortion to include the prices for those highest speeds in the evaluation when LPSS does not need, nor is it required, to have such high speeds. With that said, I recognize the recommendation, which is not a requirement, for the 10 gigabits per second for some future federal program. I suggest that we made an accommodation in our RFP to explore the opportunity for, for the higher speeds when we actually need to use them. Taking this approach would save us money now as we would just buy the one gigabit per service available that is actually what we really need. In, con in conclusion, the solicitation for this service is highly flawed as evidenced by comments from every vendor which responded. To make an award for up to five year period as proposed in the RFP is premature in light of the deficiencies in the process. Perhaps we could grant an, a three-year extension to LUS contingent on LUS meeting market prices, and that's one of the options that we have. And I thank you, Madam President, for your cooperation. All right, if there are no, if there are no other, I'm sorry, Justin. I now have a question after your presentation. Can we get Ms. Nickerson up here? Is she in the audience? Yeah. I'm sure she is. Ms. Nickerson, given the uh, recommendate or the uh, advisement of council that we have a greater risk of losing our E-rate funding, should we select, not go with the recommendation of staff? What would be the difference in pricing and cost to the system should we lose our E-rate funding and go with someone who was not recommended, specifically LUS? Good evening. You want to know what the loss in funding would be if we continue with the contract? I'd like to know what the cost is and then what the cost would be should we lose our federal funding. Currently, the cost would be, we pay, well, I don't have the total cost, but it's about $600,000, oh, overall cost, and that would be for what we currently receive, which is one gig to the high school sites, one backup elementary site, and then 100 meg to all other sites. And what is the time frame for that $600,000? Is that three years? That would be three years. So does it would it, have is to it, be renewed. Is it a linear thing where we, it's two hundred thousand dollars a year? No, it's six hundred. Six hundred per e year. Yes. Okay. E rate right. pays part of that, and then the the district pays our percentage of. Am that. I correct in recalling that E rate pays about eighty percent of that? Yeah. Well, last year it was seventy six percent. We paid twenty four. This year they would be paying eighty percent. We would pay twenty. So we pay about what? What is that? One hundred twenty thousand dollars a year about out of our budget? Yes. All right, thank you. I have a question. I have a question, Sean. If um, if we renew the contract at one gigabit, which is what we're paying have now, right? Right. And, and we compare that one gigabit to all of the other vendors. W would Lafayette Utilities be the the lower bid? 
If we stayed with one gig for um, internet, I have my sheets, I'm sorry. For WAN, one gig LUS would be cheaper. And for internet, one gig uh, detail would be cheaper. All right, thank you. Hello? What did we actually advertise for, one or 10? We asked for, we requested services for one, five, and 10. Any other questions? If not, Madam Secretary, we call for the vote. Five, four, one against. Motion carries. All right, we'll move on to item two then, which was originally item one, and that is a proposed budget for the 1516 Special Revenue Fund. Mr. Guidry? Yes, the. Uh, Let, let's give them a second, those who, those who wish to leave, Mr. Sure. Guidry. Sure. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds. All right. The uh, first proposed budget that we'll be reviewing uh, this evening is that of the uh, proposed budget for the 1516 Special Revenue Fund. Uh, the the uh, Special Revenue Fund basically is where we account for our uh, grant, our, our grants, and we have quite a, quite a few uh, in our school district. In the uh, revenue section, uh, the revenues are broken down much in the same manner as the expenses. So we'll, we'll quickly review the format. You'll notice under revenues, federal direct uh, grants of $1,999,104, uh, followed by federal through state grants of 20.1 million, state grants of 2.7 million, uh, other grants of 180,000, and miscellaneous revenue of a little over a million dollars for a, a, a total of uh, $26.1 million. The uh, detail for those revenues can basically be determined by uh, looking at the related uh, expenditure sections of the grants, and that's where we'll go to next. For example, on the federal direct grants, the expenditures, you'll notice gear up two, which is the second uh, cycle of that uh, gear up grant 1.9 million uh, and H to know uh, 110,381 for a total of 1,999,104 dollars. And the point that I'd like to make here is that uh, total of the expenditures for this for federal direct grants equals to the revenues reflected in the revenue section. The point that I'm making is if you want to see the detail of the grants that make up the revenues, you simply can refer to the expenditure section uh, because basically these are cost reimbursement grants, which mean we spend the money and then we get reimbursed uh, in an equal amount. Uh, so, so with that said, uh, I'd like to uh, proceed through the expenditure section so that we can get a better idea of the grants that are included in each category. We've already reviewed the federal direct grants. The next category is federal through state grants. Uh, so if we can scroll down to that section, we're, we're there already. Uh, we'll notice a detail for the $20.1 million there. We'll give you a, a few minutes to, uh, to take a look at the grants uh, that are included in that section. These dollar amounts uh, are determined in, in, in a few different ways, just depending on what information is available. Uh, if, if we have not received an award letter 
for the 15-16 school year. An award letter is basically where the grantor is telling us we have in fact been awarded the grant uh, and they provide us with a specific dollar amount. If that has not yet been received, then we use the 14-15 um, award amount as for budgeting purposes because that's the best information we have available at the time that we're preparing the grants, uh, preparing the proposed budget. So more times than not, uh, the numbers that are reflected in the proposed budget are agree with uh, the award amounts for the current year as opposed to what they will be in 15 and 16. And when we actually re do receive the award amounts, then we would include, if there's a difference, uh, we would uh, prepare a revised budget and, and revise it to uh, the award amount. I believe the title funds uh, title one and two we've basically been directed to uh, for the f in, until the allocations or the award amounts are actually made known to budget at 90 percent of the fiscal year 15 uh, award amount so that's what those amounts reflect uh, I believe the same for IDEA uh, applies as well so that's the detail for the 20.1 million uh, We'll scroll down to the state grants and see the detail for the uh, 2.7 million. You can also see that a large majority of this particular section is our LA4 kindergarten program. It's it's not as well as the education excellent. It's not excellence. It's not limited to those two grants. We have others, as you can tell from the listing, uh, but those are the, the larger grants in this particular category. The next category is that of uh, other grants, which is uh, another portion of the LA4 uh, preschool. Basically, it's a tuition uh, th that is estimated as being collected for the upcoming year. And then the final uh, section of miscellaneous expenditures, a million twenty-one thousand, is our Medicaid reserve fund. That's our Medicaid billing. Uh, this is where we account for our Medicaid billing and expenditures. And you'll notice the total expenditures uh, agree with the total revenues, because in essence, uh, for the most part, all of these grants are cost reimbursements. We spend the money up front, request reimbursement, and then we receive reimbursement. So I w went over it a little bit more detail than we normally do, but wanted to explain how the form format of the schedule and the different types of, uh, of grant classifications of those grants. Any, any questions? Mr. Gidry, any of these grants, uh, this may not be information you have, but are any of, the, any of these grants uh, matches, such as if we spend, you know, you say cost reimbursement, but is it the kind of thing where someone is matching dollars, a matching dollar grant, as opposed uh, to cost reimbursement? I, I believe the uh, the gear up grant uh, has a, a has some requirements uh, as part of the application process uh, where we we have to identify matching funds from entities within uh, within the area. Uh, so that would be an example of where of where uh, we, we have partnerships uh, with other entities uh, that are uh, providing in services that that we that basically have a value attached to it uh in some case it may be it may be funding i guess what what i'm asking uh as we go through this budget process and you know certainly turn over every rock trying to find cost savings to note somewhere if something comes up for cuts or some kind of decision where we would be jeopardizing twice that amount or something like that you know so we certainly let's just take the uh, early childhood grant that's the first one in the state section you know if it was the kind of thing where we would cut hundred ninety two thousand dollars out and end up with I'm gonna try and do math real quick here three hundred eighty four thousand dollars worth of expenditures lost you know that yes that kind of philosophy where let's let's you know keep that in mind as we go through the budget process sure Any other questions? The 
Next proposed budget is that of the 2015-16 Construction Fund Limited Tax Bond. And in, in this particular fund, we account for the projects that were funded by uh, proceeds from the sale of $30 million uh, bonds. Uh, and basically, we're approaching the final year of having 1516 uh, will be uh, probably the final year in which we'll expand the remainder of the funds. And so basically, you'll notice uh, that we have a beginning balance of about 5.3 million. So of the 30 plus million of pro bond proceeds, uh, we've spent all of all but 5.3 million in prior years on the projects that were that were listed uh, as a, uh, in the project listing presented to the public uh, prior to the uh, the bonds being sold, and you'll note. Uh, a listing of the projects in the expenditure section. For example, GT Linden Elementary, $476,140, followed by David Thibodeau STEM Magnet Academy, $705,666, so on and so forth. These dollar amounts represent the remainder of these projects that, should, that we're expecting to be completed in the 15-16 school year. Uh, uh, and you'll notice that all of the funds or uh, have been budgeted to be spent in that school year, and we would basically at that point be done with these uh, limited tax bond projects. Any any questions with re with regards to this fund? The next budget that we're pr presenting is the proposed budget for the fifteen sixteen. Uh, capital improvement funds and basically uh, in this particular fund we uh, budget for uh, projects that first of all are 25,000 or more in dollar amount in estimated cost uh, and it relates more to uh, e equipment replacement uh, as opposed to renovations where the renovations would be in the next fund that we'll be discussing, self-funded construction. This particular uh, proposed budget reflects that we have a beginning fund balance of eight point, roughly 8.2 million. And then you'll notice the revenue section. Uh, we're reflecting a transfer from the debt service sinking fund, uh, sales tax revenue of three million. So when we go over the sales tax proposed budget, uh, our sales tax collections, uh, three million of the distribution uh, is sent to the capital, pro Im capital improvement fund. That amount used to be 2.5 million. We've, we've increased it our, as our sales tax collections have increased. So it's sort of a standard budgeted amount that we, uh, we include. And then we reflect interest income and rental income of 75000 and, and uh, 34748 so that our beginning uh, ba fund balance and revenue is right at $11.3 million. The next section basically uh, presents the proposed projects that would be funded in the 15-16 school year, uh, assuming that this budget, proposed budget, is approved by the board. Uh, we have mainly two sections. The current section um, identified as current expenditures basically lists those projects uh, that were requested through, uh, we go basically go through a capital request time period where all of our schools and uh, office site locations have an opportunity to, to prepare a capital request form for anything uh, that they feel uh, is needed on their school site. And then all those forms uh, are presented to, uh, if they're schools, they're signed off by the academic officer, and then from there it goes to uh, planning and facilities where Mr. Cal Bordelon reviews it and signs off on it, and then uh, makes it to accounting where we summarize it and include it in the appropriate fund, either the capital improvement fund, the one we're looking at here, 
uh, or the self-funded construction fund, which, which is another type of capital fund uh, that we'll be reviewing uh, immediately following this one. So under the current expenditure section, we uh, break down uh, the various requests uh, by category. For example, we, the first category is HVAC, and you can buy it, it lists the school and the work that uh, we're proposing would be, would be done. So on the HVAC, the first project would be a kid in a high, uh, two air handlers there, followed by Karenko High, two, two air handlers there, so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, there's a section for portable buildings. Uh, there, we have a line item to relocate and set up portables. We normally budget for about eight moves because historically that, that has covered our needs throughout the school district. That comes at a cost, estimated cost of 370000 we move less than, than that amount, then we, we would move any excess amount to contingency to allow for other projects to be done. But before doing so, uh, that requires board approval. When it, whenever we, we're changing a, a dollar amount for any one of these projects, we come back to the board to let them know why we're changing it and we request approval at that time. Uh, the next item under uh, the portable building section is existing lease payments. Uh, $260,600, that's what our annual lease payments on those portable buildings that we're currently leasing. Uh, and then we have a refurbishment of a uh, portable classroom at Milton, followed by a career center uh, portable building. That is a project uh, that they have where the students uh, actually uh, participate in constructing a portable building and then that portable building is uh, then moved at the completion of the school year uh, is moved to a school site uh, that uh, has a need for a portable building. So this actually funds a project for the Career Center. We have a uh, portable building for plantation, uh, $90,000, uh, that request uh, we, we placed it on the, the proposed budget. Uh, when we come back in June and present these, these same budgets one more time, uh, if they're at that point in time, if we've identified uh, or we become aware of that there's a portable building that frees up elsewhere, uh, then we would, in fact, uh, eliminate this particular line item uh, and place it in the contingency fund. So for the time being, uh, we have it on there, and if we become aware of any uh, excess portable buildings uh, that become available, then we would we would adjust it before we finalize the budget. Any questions through this point? Yeah. Yes, sir. I have uh, a couple of questions. Number one, uh, I noticed we're buying some air conditioning equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Are you satisfied, uh, Mr. Gidry, that the um, – the uh, maintenance agreement we have with is it Bernhardt? Bernhardt? Are you satisfied that we're saving saving money on that under that agreement? Well, what, uh, the the only equipment that that we should see uh, that we're replacing uh, would be the equipment that was on the limited liability list. Meaning, uh, when we signed the contract, when we entered into that that agreement, they basically the agreement was such that, with the exception of a, a listing of specific equipment. Uh, that the remaining equipment would be fully covered, fully maintenance. I understand. And, Are and you so satisfied that we're, in, in fact... So, in essence, um, uh, we're tracking any, any replacements. We're, we're verifying that they are, in fact, on the, li on the limited liability equipment listing and not a responsibility of, of Bernhardt. So, yes, sir. But historically, other spending, we had a lar fairly large staff. Now we have a... I don't know how much... What, I know our staff has been reduced, but... In the overall general scheme of things, that you're satisfied with the um, yes, and uh, I, I believe uh, financially speaking, o yeah. o overall uh, we might be spending possibly spending an additional two or three hundred thousand a year, uh, but in in return, uh, a few things are happening. First of all, uh, the response time has been increased significantly. 
uh, because that's in our contract. Uh, and secondly, secondly, uh, that particular uh, those particular repairs are not being deferred in the manner that they were previously, either because of lack of manpower to address them or lack of funds. So I think the benefit uh, has been uh, that we are we have a quicker response time and the maintenance is no longer being deferred. We're actually doing, getting it done on a timely basis. So over time, uh, that should equate to uh, savings because if we're maintaining our equipment on a scheduled basis, that equipment should last longer. So and I have another this question. Uh, at this point, I'm satisfied, and, and Mr. Borlaw could might uh, be able to expand on that if he so chooses. Well, I'd like to I have a question for Mr. Borlaw. As a matter of fact, I have two questions for Mr. Borlaw as it relates to this. O on your way up, Kyle, you and I and, and uh, Burnell met at Cairngorm Heights, and we saw where there was a dire need for additional parking, and I think uh, it, it included perhaps a little bit of drainage work in an existing ditch, and you said that um, uh, the engineer for, s for the city of Karen Crow was going to look into that for, you, for us, mm -hmm. and then maybe some shell or gravel or whatever so that they could park. Is that in here somewhere, or is that where, 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 where what's at what stage is that? Um, Fence to Maker and Associates is the city engineer for Karen Crow, and they are working on two drainage improvement projects along uh, St. Anne Street and um, I still can't remember the, the road that, that tees into St. Anne Street. So those projects are moving forward. Um, the, the additional parking at Karen Crow Heights, I, I remember we talked about it. I'm trying to locate it in uh, property. property. See Karen Crow Heights resurface bus lane. <clears throat> okay, I'm not. Billy, do you remember the, the Karen Crow Heights uh, additional faculty parking area? <clears throat> I remember we discussed that when we met about all of the submittals. Yes, I, uh, you on just a minute. I, I thought I saw. Uh, Self fund oh, it's in self-funded construction, which is the next the, the next, next section. We have it in there. It's in there. The next page, the next report. Oh, okay. The next it's in the next one we're looking at. I'm sorry. I I, I thought it was under this one. I th that okay. That that question's been answered. I yeah. Have a okay. Time. I found it. I have one other one. Just one other question. Yes, sir. The young lady who got up here the other day and swore she tried 50 times to get the classroom painted and we never did paint it. Did we ever, did you ever meet with her? What's I'm exaggerating, not 50 times, but. Myrtle Place. Uh, no, but I did, I did call the principal about that and, and I did look in the school dude work order system and since 2004 uh, when we started school dude, there's only been, mm, help me out, seven or eight work order requests for painting in the cafeteria and we've completed all of those. The last request for painting in the cafeteria was in I think 2011 or 2012 and that's been completed. So um, I'm not real sure exactly. I, I did speak to the principal about it and the principal is putting in a work order for that work so we are s trying to schedule that for this summer. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Kyle, I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Explain to me the process on how these items actually get on this list. Is it just requested or you have a list of requests and you review them and you decide the need? I'll let Mr. Gidry answer that question. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, capital request forms are available to, to all uh, schools and uh, office sites and uh, those forms are uh, prepared and uh, forwarded to go through a, an approval process uh, which eventually uh, makes it into a, uh, a summary and uh, then we meet 
with the superintendent uh, and review all of the all of the requests and come up with the uh, listing of uh, uh, projects which we were proposed to, to actually have funded. That's, that's basically the, the, the process that we go through. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ella. Yes. We've got refurbished portable building number 15. What? In, in our lease, do we just lease the building and we're responsible for the upkeep, all the upkeep? We've got a $35,000 refurbish. That, that is a building that we currently own, Mr. Bruce Ord. It's not okay. Yeah. Uh, that one but one but the lease. buildings that we do lease, uh, we do some very, very minor maintenance, but any major refurbishing is on the company that we lease it from. Do we have a timeline, five years, ten years, then they take it back and refurbish it and bring it back, or they just as needed? As needed. Justin? That brings up a good point. Am, am I reading this correctly, that out of the, I uh, forget what the exact number was you provided to us last week, 430 uh, portable classrooms that we only leased 24 of them? Well, that's 24 buildings and I believe all of those are double units, so they'd be 48 classrooms. Okay, all right, so, yes, sir. so roughly 10% then is what we lease as opposed to own. Yes, sir, and, and every opportunity we get to send one back home, we take that opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Billy? Okay, the next section is that of uh, uh, re replacement vehicles. Uh, we have one for the uh, painting department, a van for the painting department, a uh, truck for the plumbing department, uh, three for the maintenance department, and all of these are replacements uh, for uh, vehicles that are uh, 20 plus years uh, old and uh, mileage range anywhere. Well, all, all the mileage and all the vehicle, all of these vehicles are, are in excess of 150,000. Most of them in the 160 to 200,000 range, uh, with the exception of one, and that one was uh, was uh, involved in an accident, and it costs more to repair it than it does. Uh, to, uh, basically, it was totaled. Uh, so one one of these vehicles uh, is being replaced because it's no longer drivable and then the others because of the, the miles and, and the years that are on them. It, so these are all replacement vehicles. None of them are additional vehicles. The, uh, these vehicles are followed by uh, some re uh, replacement equipment. The, uh, we have a scissor lift, uh, which allows us to uh, get some of our maintenance work done in, inside of our buildings areas it might be changing changing of lights in gyms things of that nature uh, a snorkel lift uh, which is more for outdoor use uh, it allows us again changing of lights that are a little bit maybe side of a building so you may not need to be able to go straight up and you actually have to uh, to come at it uh, from a different angle as well as uh, tree trimming uh, it allows uh, provides for that uh, and then we have uh, dump trailers for our ground crew, too, uh, and a uh, bobcat skid steer, which basically uh, is, has a, fr a front end bucket to, to, to move materials around, as well as uh, uh, forks that are attached uh, to, uh, to, to pick up limbs and, and put them in a truck. So uh, for areas like crosswalks where Right now, our uh, maintenance folks are required to basically load up a, a wheelbarrow to get it because we can't pass any large equipment uh, under the canopies. Uh, this smaller piece of equipment would allow that work to be done at a much quicker pace because uh, the, uh, the loads of materials increase considerably, uh, not to mention uh, the convenience uh, of having the forks to actually, uh, if it's a matter of uh, branches that have been cut, 
uh, gathering the branches and lifting it and putting it into uh, the trailers. So that's what that piece of equipment uh, would be used for. Any questions on the on the vehicle section before we move on to the wall covers? Next section is property improvements. You'll notice that there are walkway covers at Prairie, uh, Ernest Gallet, Alice Boucher. Uh, we have a resurfacing of bus lanes at Karen Crow Heights, uh, new student lockers at Como High, a covered walkway to portable building at Milton, uh, as well as a covered walkway at Northside High. Uh, so here's an example, Ms. Morrison, where, well, you, where you can see uh, the, each one of these was an individual re capital request from the from the school principal uh, for that particular work to be done. Uh, so, uh, and it's it's uh, categorized by the nature of the work. So here it's uh, property improvements, and then you'll notice in the uh, the next one is the athletic department, but it's a resurfacing of Northside High track. So that's sort of how it works. The the requests are reviewed. Uh, we we de determine which ones we'd like to propose to the board for consideration, uh, and then and then we place them uh, in the proposed budget. So, that you know, the, the ones that we decide maybe we're not doing at this time, they're putting on, put on another list for next year. Or I want to know what happens to the ones that are not that does not make it on this list. Uh, that, we we basically we basically. Uh, uh, on the summary report, we put it in the in the in the column that's not funded, uh, or not proposed to be funded, uh, and uh, so that for future reference. Uh, but we do ask that the uh, schools, if if a particular project is not funded, that they include it on on the subsequent year's capital request, uh, unless it's just something. For example, uh, you might have a situation where for one that comes to mind is, a, is they requested uh, a new wing at the, at the uh, estimated cost of $9.6 million. Well, that, that would almost deplete both funds. So something like that, we would let them know that uh, that would be something that would be more geared towards a bond. You know, if, if we were to sell bonds, that project would be, would be better would be considered at that point in time. Uh, but other smaller projects that actually have a chance of being funded, uh, given the, res the, uh, res uh, the amount of money that we have available, uh, we put in a non-funded section, uh, and we, uh, we do review it when we start the process next year as to which ones weren't funded. Uh, and normally, we see them again uh, uh, when we go through the same process uh, in, in, the, in the following year. Any any uh, questions on the property improvement section? Next section is that of uh, the athletic uh, department, and there we have uh, we're proposing the resurfacing of the north side high track. Next, next area is that of child nutrition. You notice that there's a forklift uh, included there uh, for uh, movement of the food, food products in the warehouse. Uh, and then we have cooler freezer replacements uh, at Woodvale, uh, Paul Bro, Edgar, uh, Ed, Edgar Morton Middle, and G.T. Linden. Uh, well, uh, G.T. Linden is a kitchen hood replacement but at Woodvale, Paul Brown, uh, Edgar Morton, it's a uh, cooler freezer replacements. And, and those are basically identified on, uh, you know, which ones uh, are, are in the, basically are in most need of replacement. Normally they're identified uh, during our audits by the state. Uh, they come up with discussion uh, and we always make a note of it. And when funds become available, we replace those that are, that are in the worst condition. So. Uh, that's what we have here. In the printing department, we have a Vario Print 120. That's basically a copy machine. Uh, we're at a point that the one that's being replaced is, is no longer 
uh, covered by a maintenance contract because of its age. Uh, so it was just uh, cheaper. What happens at that point in time is uh, whenever the copier breaks, uh, it's basically on our dollar. We, we cannot uh, purchase a maintenance agreement uh, and it becomes considerably a lot more expensive to do that. So at that point in time, we normally replace them. And it's a high volume use. Uh, this is the copier, one of the copiers that's used in the print shop uh, for the entire school district. So we're looking at or proposing to replace that one. We have a contingency for capital projects, uh, $300,000. That basically allows us to address if any of these projects come in over uh, what our estimates are. Uh, then we would come to the board at that point in time. You may be, fam you may have already seen it, where when we come to the board to to request approval on a, a bid award, uh, you, in the funding section, if our budget amount is not adequate, we indicate that by approving this item, the board is approving a budget increase in the amount of whatever that additional amount that's needed, uh, and this is this is the line item that that would come from. So. Before we use this particular contingency line item, we come to the board uh, to request approval so that we can make the board aware of what exactly, which project exactly we would be using those contingency funds for. You'll notice the next line item under the other caption is a prior year carryover project, uh, $3,074,940, that is, uh, those projects that were started in the 14-15 year that won't be completed till the 15-16 year. So we estimate the cost that it would take to complete those projects in the next school year, and that's the three million seventy-four thousand nine forty, uh, which we have a uh, detailed schedule, and we'll go ahead and, and call that one up. Might have to reduce the size of that. You'll notice notice the uh, total of these projects agrees with what's reflected in the proposed budget. This is the detail of those projects that make up that amount. And again, these are projects that are just carrying forward from the current school year, 1415, that will not be completed by June 30. So we carry over the estimated remaining funds that are needed to complete those projects. We have a transfer to general fund of $270,500 that's being proposed. That's detailed at schedule two. Much like we have a detailed schedule for the uh, carryover projects from 1415, we have a detail of the projects uh, for this transfer to general fund. I mentioned that the process is such that the schools and our office, uh, various office sites, submit these capital requests. And when they submit them, we, we categorize them as either capital improvement, self-funded construction, or maintenance. Uh, if they're under 25,000, then 25,000 in, in, in cost, then they, they do not qualify for either two of those capital project funds. So that would mean the general fund would need to take care of it. Well, for those line items that are in the 10 to 20 to, to $24,999 range, uh, we, we select those that we feel are critical uh, that, that they be done, but we also feel that to ask the general fund's maintenance budget to absorb it uh, would put the maintenance budget uh, in a bond. We, we would end up coming up short at the end of the year. So we actually ask for a transfer from the capital <laughs> funds to the general fund, in this case in the to the tune of $270,500, and you'll see uh, which projects were being requested uh, that through the capital request process system that are actually general fund items. Now, I mentioned that the estimated cost would have to be $25,000 or more to be considered a capital project. Well, you'll notice the, fir the first line item is $49,000. Uh, we apply that on a per unit basis, meaning uh, 
we look at, in this case, is zero turn moors to replace the, some of the moors uh, that are at the schools. Uh, there are three of them. So a little over $16,000 a piece. It's that per unit cost that we look at, the 16000 not not the grand total uh, in making that determination. So you'll see that there are uh, three lawnmowers, uh, some replacement labs at Karen Crow Academy of Information Technology. Their computer labs uh, uh, have been around for a while and require replacement. Uh, bleachers and team benches for uh, at uh, Thibodeau STEM, Lafayette High, uh, some equipment for their meat processing facility, uh, Milton Elementary security cameras, uh, as well as tree trimming in the courtyard area, uh, West Side Elementary additional parking spaces, uh, and school food services, a pallet jack. We'll go back to the uh, proposed budget. Uh, we're looking at the next line item, which is reserved for 16-17 expenditures, 4.8 million. In our proposed budget, we, we, at a minimum, we try to budget or allow for three million dollars of projects. We set, th we try to, we attempt to, to set aside three million dollars uh, in reserves for the next school year. So right now we're budgeting 15, 16, uh, but we want to make sure we have funds available for 16, 17, because if we expend all the funds in one year and have no funds left for the, the subsequent school year, uh, that would really put us in a bind. So this particular line item is just that. It's reserved to make sure or set aside uh, to have funding available for uh, 16, 17 school year for capital project needs uh, in that school year. A standard line item that we have each year is classroom setup furniture. If there are new classrooms, additional classrooms being set up, uh, we, uh, we, we fund the furniture uh, from this particular uh, line item. And then of course uh, audit fees, which are assigned based on the amount of time the auditors spend uh, auditing uh, this particular fund. That the total of the proposed projects, both new and carryover, as well as the reserve for 1617, total 11.2 million, which leaves us a projected fund balance of about $100,000. That's just a standard amount that we that we try to come to each year. Uh, it's no more than an additional contingency, if you would, you know, if you want to view it that way. Uh, and then again. We also have that 4.8 million set aside for 16, 17, uh, that allow us a little bit of breathing room as well. We we try to keep that at three, three million, uh, and it's at 4.8. So we have a low breathing room there uh, as well with with regards to uh, if there are additional projects that have not yet been identified uh, that may come up during the year. So with that said, I, uh, I know we've been asking for questions uh, as we've gone through the budget, but I, I'll ask one more time before we move to the next one if there's any questions here uh, for this particular uh, fund, which is the uh, Capital Improvements Fund. The next proposed budget is the 1516 Self-Funded Construction Projects Fund. And it's much in the same format as the one that we just went over. So I'll, I'll go over it a little bit quicker. It's not to, ru not to rush us through the process, but since the format's the same, it's gonna be easier to, fo to, to follow along. We begin with the fund balance of uh, 14.5 million. And we reflect the transfers in from the general fund for, uh, these are dedicated taxes for asbestos removal, that's the 175,000. We budget, the standard budget amount, sales tax revenue of three million, and we reflect interest income of $20,000. It gives us a uh, total fund balance and revenues that are available for projects of about $17.8 million. The uh, next section, entitled General and Administrative 
is basically the salaries and benefits uh, for running the uh, project management uh, facilities department. Uh, and that totals the one, $199,390. And then we get into the actual construction projects where we begin with the administrative uh, contingency amount of 500000 followed by the, the uh, various uh, projects. Again, uh, these are the capital requests that we received from the schools uh, and office sites that qualify as self-funded construction capital projects. So that's what's being listed here. Uh, unless the board wishes for me to go through each line item separately, I'll, I'll give you all a few minutes to, to, to look over the projects listed uh, to see if there are any questions. I have a question, Billy, uh, and it, it's a general question, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll pick one. Um, Cadiana High repaint exterior of the school, and you have, what, $75,000. Is that, is that the labor and the materials, or is that just the materials, and we do the labor, or is that contracted out? It's, um, it's my understanding that it's uh, material and labor. Uh, that would be something that's contracted out because of the size. We wouldn't the, do it. The size of the project. Oh. Yes, sir. Mr. Gidry. Yes. On these carry forward projects, the expenditures, how long have some of these projects been on the drawing board? Is this just from this year moving forward or has it been the last couple of years? Uh, the, if you'll notice uh, the, well, I, I see where that's, that's not the case. Uh, I didn't know what that one was on the side, if that was yeah, that, one that, year or... that basically uh, refers to the footnote that says that these projects have started or are expected to start prior to fiscal year 15. Uh, those, these particular carryover projects, our, our general rule is if the project has not been started by the end of 14-15, the current year, okay, uh, then we'll, we will only carry it over one year so we shouldn't have this accumulation of projects that carry over from year to year to year they basically can get carried over one year and if it doesn't get done in the second year then it comes in as a as a new project it has to be rebudgeted we're not going to include it as a, a carryover project two years uh, unless we have a situation uh, one, one example would be our uh, software conversion on our for our finance department and HR, uh, that that will take as we convert the various modules that that will cross over maybe a three year period by the time it's all done, that would be carried over for a couple of years. But for the most part, we have one year to carry over, and then it just goes back into this process where they have to ask for it again. What would be the process to not have these things eliminated and get them completed? I mean, if they were asked for and they're budgeted, it would it would be my opinion that, you know, we go forward with the project and complete it, like Ernest Gallet ad covered walkway. I mean, the money has been there since this school year, and it'll be carried over the next year. But if we, for some reason, don't get to it, it just goes away, and they have they have to go through the process again. Or the metal roof at Broussard Elementary. Yes, the, the, the idea, uh, Mr. Lachelle, is uh, we had run into a situation where we had projects being carried over from year to year right. that, that weren't getting done. And so ultimately, uh, some of them were, and, and this was, we're talking about six or seven years ago. It's not, now they're getting, they're, it's getting done uh, uh, much quicker. Uh, <clears throat> But, but you're talking about what we had were carryover projects that had accumulated over a, a number of years, 
uh, to where they almost had no meaning because uh, it had been so long that they hadn't been taken care of that we had other projects uh, that were more, that were higher priority, like roofing projects uh, that had to be done. So in essence, the carryover listing was, was did, did not have much meaning at that point in time. So that's when about six years ago we decided uh, that you basically have a year to, to get it done. And if you don't get it done, you have to be able to explain why you don't get it done. It, so it, it, it's, it's been an incentive uh, f for those projects to get done, not to have to come back and ask for them again. Because the fact that they make it on the list, uh, if the board approves it, you know, has, has a great deal of meaning, not only to the schools, but also to, uh, to the folks at central office. Because if we have a project that's approved, we want to we do our best to make sure it gets done. Uh, the reason I ask, I, I know we serve the whole school district, but looking on the list of the stuff that's been carried forward, there's a good bit of my schools that have, you know, things they've asked for, and they've addressed these with me over the last couple of weeks to see when and if some of these will get started. So I just wanted to kind of be clear on what needs to be done to get these projects started and moving forward, being some of them a, a year old already. But thank you. So, and, and some of them are, uh, are actually in progress right now, and you would, you would know, I guess, by, by just talking uh, to your, uh, your school administrators, but uh, you, can, you can tell those that are not an even amount, you know, like 135,000 would suggest to me that uh, that one hadn't been started yet, but if you see something for $60,785, that's normally an indication that that's the remaining funds for, for that particular project. So that's sort of a way if you can, that you can tell whether or not it's been started. Uh, but we can, uh, we can follow through with comments as to what, what, what is the, uh, what point in the process are the carryover projects? We can actually note that um, and provide that to all board members. Uh, in, in a Friday newsletter, uh, and specifically when we come back with these with these proposed budgets, we'd be happy to do that. Yeah, because some of them just look like have to be seasonal, or when, when you know when school's out. I mean the uh, gym lighting upgraded uh, Acadian Middle or Paul Bro Middle. Yes, I, I, mean, I don't think that can be done while school's in. Right. So that's all summer projects that would probably be coming up this summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So with, so with regards to the construction projects, uh, the new, new projects, any questions with any of the projects listed there? There's a total of about 6.2 million. And then the uh, carry forward projects from the 14-15 school year are listed, which is about another 6 million. And in, in essence, uh, followed by, uh, we have several reserves set up. Uh, would like to call your attention to the fact that we are proposing a, a roofing reserve. This is something that's new. It's at $500,000. Uh, basically, our roofing warranties, we're about a couple of years away from uh, they're, they're starting to expire. And uh, it, I guess it, it might have been about seven or eight years ago. Uh, we're in a situation where a, a great majority of our con capital funds were being used for roofing projects to the point where we almost couldn't address anything else. Uh, so we thought it would be, uh, having, having experienced that once, that if we start, we have about two more years uh, uh, of, of uh, warranty on the, I, I think the, the, one, the first ones that are gonna start expiring. So we have, it gives us a little bit of time to start putting money aside because these roofing projects are pretty considerable. 
uh, they're in the, the 600 to million dollar range depending on the, the area that you that you're covering it could be less if it's just patchwork but if it's replacement it's considerable uh, so for this particular line item we, we want to start building up a reserve so that we don't run into that same situation where our roofing projects in the future once the warranties expire and are, and are needed replacement basically doesn't decimate our, our entire budget or take require our entire budget so that that's what that line items for the next line item says reserve for uh, SLCC cooperative agreement uh, last year the board approved uh, uh, two uh, payments to uh, the community college where our uh, uh, early college academy is located early, early and uh, this is the second of those two we've already made one in the current year five hundred thousand dollars and uh, in the agreement in return uh, the amount of space made available on the campus for our students would increase from 250 250 students to a thousand uh, so that's what that five hundred thousand is for the next line item is reserved for 16 17 expenditures and that's basically putting that money aside uh, for the 16 17 school year to make sure that we have funding available for, for projects in that school year we try to keep that n that number at 3 million at a minimum it's at 3.9 million so we, we have we have a little bit of uh, room there uh, in terms of uh, if there are other projects that the that the board may want to consider or when, when we get to when we get to debt service uh, one of the opportunities will be uh, or one of the considerations for the board would be this money could be transferred for debt servicing of debt so if we if the board is interested in selling bonds uh, here's an opportunity to, tra to to have funds available without decreasing this dollar amount below three million dollars could transfer the, some of these funds a portion or all to debt service and use that to, to service debt to, to service bond payments uh, and what that would allow us to do we'll be coming to the board in the very near future with what we feel uh, we could support in terms of bond sales internally without going to without going to the public uh, so that we can have to, some discussions as to uh, what the the project listings that the board would be in favor of uh, if and when those bonds would be sold so keep that in mind uh, and we'll be doing that probably uh, an upcoming finance committee meeting followed by a board meeting where we'll talk about our bonding capacity based on what we can afford to service not what our the capacity of our school district is meaning what's the total number what's the total dollar value of bonds that we can issue it's more what is the total amount of bonds we can sell and afford the debt service uh, on so we'll be, we'll be coming back to the board with that but just keep that in mind uh, that these funds can be used for that as well so that that takes care of the self-funded construction uh, proposed budget any questions on it The next proposed budget is uh, that of debt service. And the final final column is uh, the proposed budget for 1516. And this, this is basically driven by our, our debt service requirements. Uh, we have a transfer in from a uh, sales tax fund of 7.4 million. Uh, again that uh, that that basically meets uh, or that is the highest I think that's one year's worth of payments is that correct Matt? Yeah. that we require to taking any ad valorem taxes into we're not using any ad valorem taxes we're using all sales taxes to basically have one year of payments ahead of ourselves as we're, we're, we're required to do uh, the next section you'll notice the actual debt service principal and interest it totals about 10.9 million 
We have a uh, transfer in of uh, 4.9 million, mainly from the general fund. From from the general fund, so when we're going over the general fund budget, you you will see that, and that's a good bit of that is uh, the the, the uh, Q skip money, the qualified school construction bonds that we sold uh, over the past uh, four or five years. And the thirty million, and the 30 million, is limited. And the 30 million of the limited tax uh, uh, bond funds, the projects that we went over that we said we had a little over five million left of construction to complete that. Uh, and that's basically the, the budget for the debt service fund. We have uh, the detail that supports it, uh, basically breaks down the, the summary numbers into the various types of debt that we have. And uh, that, that's more or less as, uh, su supplementary information for, for the board to review. And if you all have any questions, uh, we can, uh, we can go over those uh, the next time we review these uh, this, these budgets. The next fund is that of the two th uh, proposed budget for the 1516 sales tax fund. Basically the, the format of this schedule is such that we reflect uh, the three taxes are being collected for the school system. That's the 65, 88, and 2002 tax. And then all of the other governmental entities are reflected uh, in the following column. So you'll note that we collect about $248 million a year, uh, of which uh, approximately half goes to other, other governmental taxing authorities and, and approximately half stay stays with the uh, school board. That's the revenue section. The expenditure section is basically the personnel at our sales tax department. This is basically what it costs to collect uh, those revenues. And so if you take a look at uh, the total expenditures of $2.3 it's a little less than 1%. That's, pretty, that's a pretty good rate. Uh, well, it's not a pretty good. It's, it's a very good rate, very good rate. So that the revenues that are available for distribution, net revenues, uh, are what, what we arrive at once we deduct the expenses of collections. So for the 65 tax, for example, it's 64.5 million that's available for distribution. The 88 tax is 27.7 million and the 2002 tax, 27.7 million. Those numbers are followed by a distribution section where it, we reflect which funds these revenues are allocated or distributed to. So you notice for the general fund, uh, 51, well, first of all, <coughs> the general fund is what's left. Once we transfer to the bond sinking fund, the $7.5 million, that's a requirement. That's, that's the first distribution that's required, legally required. Then we, here are those two $3 million amounts that we just reviewed in the two capital fund budgets, the capital improvement fund and the self-funded construction. And the remaining amount of $51,003,907 goes to the general fund. So when we review the general fund, uh, that will be one of the revenue items that we will see there. Same thing for the 88 tax, you'll notice that all of it goes to the general fund because the dedications for, those t for, for that particular tax are uh, operations related They're for, for operating line items, which our general fund is our operating fund, so that's why it all goes there. And you'll notice the 2002 tax, of course, goes all in its entirety to the 2002 sales tax fund. I will say that I would ask you to keep in mind that these revenue amounts reflect a projected increase over the current year's collections of 2%. The most recent collections report year to date uh, indicates that we're at about 5.7% 
better than than 13, 14. So in 14, 14, 15, currently, the most recent report, and you're talking about uh, January when we, when we prepare these schedules because it's, it's December collections. We were a five point year to date, 5.7%. Uh, the collections were 5.7% more than they were the year before. So, in our budget, we're budgeting for a 2% increase over the current year uh, collections, which is, a little, which is not even half of, of, of what we're experiencing at this point. I want to uh, clarify that <clears throat> it's typical for us to take the prior year's sales tax collections and budget the sales tax fund at that level for the following year, correct? So if, uh, we, if we collect X in 14, 15, then the budget item for 15, 16 will be X, as opposed to the year before when it was some percentage of X, assuming that it increased, right? It, it, past practice has been to budget flat meaning whatever we projected in this case, whatever we would project to have been collected uh, by the end of 1415 uh, is what we would budget for 1516. So uh, this is not budgeting flat. This is actually budgeting a 2% increase. A 2% increase over the 5% increase? Uh, a 2% yes, it's a 2% increase of what, of what we're anticipating to collect in 1415. Uh, an, an increase over the current year collections. It's not over the five. Yeah. It's over the flat. No. Well, the you flat know. is the five. I'm sorry. All right. So budgeting flat means if our let's just say our sales tax revenue increased by five percent in fourteen fifteen, then the budget number, if we were budgeting flat, would be include that five percent. I was clarifying that. Okay, I understand. Two percent. Over the compounded five, yeah, yes, and and um, that that's important to note because when we get to the general fund uh, in the finance committee, especially, and we'll we'll see that tomorrow night at the board meeting, uh, there's a line item for for the impact of this two percent project this projection of two percent. It's about one point seven million dollars. Uh, it's significant in that uh, if it's if, if the board decides not to go that route and recognize a 2%, then of course there would be an additional 1.7 million of cuts that would have to be made. So it's one of these things where uh, it's just a matter of uh, how comfortable uh, do we feel budgeting a 2% increase. Uh, we have no crystal ball, you know, his historically, uh, if we went just on uh, historical numbers alone the last three to four years, there'd be no hesitation. But back in 2010, uh, we we had a, a million dollar a month decrease, so there are no guarantees, uh, but we feel that it is it it is conservative if you look at what the increased percentages have been over the last three years, if the board so chooses to view it in that manner. Thank you for clarifying, Mr. Gidry. Sure. I'd ask if there are any questions with regards to the uh, sales tax proposed sales tax budget. The uh, next proposed budget is that for 2015-2016 Child Nutrition Services Fund. Our, our experience over the last two to three years uh, in this particular fund uh, is that uh, food costs have, have, have gone up considerably. Uh, and that, that's been one of that and, and, and controlling labor costs, of course. Uh, it, it's going up for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the nutritional requirements uh, of the meals uh, have resulted in uh, uh, food items that are more expensive. Uh, and in general, the cost of food uh, has, has increased. The format of this particular budget is we list all of the revenues first, much like the other budgets, and you'll notice the local pay, basically our collections from our, from our students. 
uh, who are uh, either full pay or uh, reduced pay. Then we have adult sales, extra sales if our students or adults uh, purchase uh, additional, say, uh, fruit drink or uh, fruit uh, milk or something to that effect. Then you have your federal reimburse, uh, reimbursement amount in the, uh, for both the regular school year and the summer feeding program, followed by uh, interest income uh, if we're awarded any grants, uh, USDA receipts, which is basically commodities, and there's an MFP transfer from the general fund to child nutrition uh, to help cover uh, the cost for that fund. So what ends up happening is you'll, you'll notice that the, or I'd ask you to, to, to note that the revenues of 15.5 million ties to the expenses of 15.5 million. It's a, it's a, it's a break-even or a balanced budget. And the way that's done is whatever, if and when the child nutrition, child, the school food service fund this is has a shortfall then the transfer from the general fund is increased by whatever that shortfall is so it's it's one of these things Ms. Sherville the director of that particular program has has done a, a really good job at keeping the cost down and minimizing uh, the amount that's needed from the general fund to to balance that particular budget one one of the things that one of the programs uh, that that has just been made available or it's just that has just become economically feasible for our school district is that of the uh, community eligibility provision uh, program and and basically uh, what that what that does is uh, based on certain parameters that are set up by the USDA uh, if a school qualifies and they, they look at these would this, these would be high poverty uh, school districts or high poverty schools as determined by uh, direct certification uh, files that are that are downloaded from the state uh, we may qualify such that if if our uh, schools have have a their percentage of direct cert uh, students as well as they look at uh, homeless and migrant and so on and so forth that's all thrown into the mix and then you multiply that by a factor to determine what percent reimbursement you'll get and for and I, it uh, it's for the breakfast and lunch program so that it's very possible uh, if you have a school that has a, a very high percentage that comes out to a hundred or higher once you multiply uh, their direct cert number and homeless number that, that basically that, that combined number once you multiply by that factor if it's a hundred or more percent or more that means that all students are eligible to eat for free even the students that would have been uh, paying or uh, reduced so once the school when a school qualifies, what you can end up doing is you you you, you group them uh, such that you can offer that program uh, where the the meals are, are basically reimbursed by the federal government based on the calculations that are set forth as part of this program. So we're going to, we're we're going to come back to the board at a board meeting, either the next meeting it may be the second meeting in May and go into detail uh, as to the calculations uh, and the three or four options really that are available to us. The option that we have reflected in this budget, proposed budget, is the one that uh, includes those schools that result in 100% reimbursement. In other words, there would be no additional cost to the school district, and that's important given the, fun, you know, the financial challenges we face. The, the, upside to that with regards to our our students is that all students of those schools would in fact uh, eat for free 
their, their meals will be reimbursed through this program. Uh, so we'll come back with, with a, 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 an explanation as to the details and the options that we see we have available. Uh, we're, we're deferring to a later meeting because of the number of budgets we have to go through and we wanted to give a good 15 or 20 minutes to this presentation because it's, it's, uh, it's very important uh, to us that everyone under, everybody's on the same page as to how the program works uh, so that once we begin implementing it and, and we start getting questions, uh, we're all answering in the same manner. So just keep in mind that uh, this particular budget does reflect or assume uh, participation in that program and we'll be coming back to the board in May to, uh, with uh, a presentation on, on this particular program. This particular budget, we've gone over the revenue section, the expenditure section are basically uh, the cost of food, the salary and benefits of our cafeteria workers and administ uh, administration, and uh, equipment repairs, and various other costs uh, of running the program. Any, any questions with regards to the school food service budget, proposed budget? Mr. Gidry, where did you say they're going to pull the information to make that determination from the schools or? Uh, uh, the, the information comes from, from the state. The state, okay. Uh, by school. And then the per schools school. can be grouped based on these calculations. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through the process and, and how the calculations work uh, when, when we come back to the board uh, with a, a full presentation. Okay, thank you. The next proposed budget is that of the 2002 half cent sales tax. This particular budget, the first line item is revenues. The final, the column to the far right is the proposed budget for 15-16. We've also included information from 14-15 and 13-14 for, for comparative purposes to assist you uh, uh, in your review. The revenues are the, those revenues that we showed in the sales tax fund as being distributed or collected for the 2002 Two, 2002 sales tax fund. Those two numbers will tie. So you can go back to the sales tax fund and see this $27.3 million reflected in that budget. The expenditure section, the first line item is that of teacher raises, uh, $18.5 million. Uh, that basically covers um, an 11.2 percent increase that was given not long after the tax was passed. Uh, it also includes the cost of that portion of the step increases that have been funded by the 2002 sales tax for qu qualified participants, el el eligible participants only over the, over the years as approved by the board. And it also includes the cost of two $1,000 increases that were included in the salary schedule but are, that are funded through the 2002 tax. So that's what that 18.5 million represents. Each of these line items is basically a dedication uh, that's included in the, in the administrative plan. Uh, we, we record it as such so that uh, a read of the financial statements can see how much we're spending on each dedication. Instructional counseling, uh, we currently are not spending anything in that area. Uh, the next area, the next line item is professional development. You'll see that uh, we're recognizing or proposing an increase there uh, to reflect one day of mandatory professional development and one day of optional professional development. Lowering class size, uh, you'll see an increase there from 1.7 uh, million that's budgeted for the 14, 15 school year to 3.1 million in the 15, 16. That increase is reflects the transfer of those 
the proposed transfer of those 24 alternative education teachers that are included on the inventory listing that we've been reviewing for the general fund. So uh, it just so happens we're reviewing this fund before we review the general fund, so we need to reflect it here. And then uh, as we go through the process uh, and the board starts taking action on, on these budgets, uh, they'll be adjusted accordingly or if, if needed. If that particular line item would not be approved by the board when reviewing the general fund uh, proposed budget, then we, that would automatically uh, require us to come back, modify this budget, proposed budget, before we submit it in its final form when we come back in June. So that's sort of how it works. But that's the purpose or that's the reason for that increase. Those, that transfer, it's a proposed budget. We're proposing that it be done in the general fund, so we have to reflect that it's also being done in the 2002 sales tax fund. The next line item is uh, tutoring and extra instruction. Not much change there. You'll notice we had another retirement, and that's one of those line items that the board has indicated that as individuals whose full salaries that are being funded by this fund retire, we're not to put their replacements uh, in this fund. We're to move them to the general fund with regards to how their salaries are funded. Excess revenues over expenditures of 3.4 million. We have a beginning operational fund balance of 16.1, uh, bringing us to uh, a budgeted fund balance of 19.6 million. Next section is the interest reserve. That's the check, basically the distribution that will be coming to the board, I believe, uh, tomorrow night, to where we accumulate the interest earnings on these sales tax collection and make a distribution in May. This shows a beginning balance of uh, fund balance of 75,000, uh, estimated interest income of 127, uh, and we would distribute 127, leaving us with 75,000. That's the 13th check. That's mentioned. That is uh, the 13th check. You, you may hear us refer to 13th check as the check that goes out in May. The check that goes out in October, we refer to as the 14th check, uh, and that's the excess distribution, uh, which comes from the, the remaining sales tax collections that are, if we have any excess, once we're uh, done expending or addressing, meeting all of the uh, budgeted requirements, all of the items that we're committed to spending it on, if there's an excess, and that's the amount that's distributed as a 14th check in October. So I just wanted to distinguish between the 13th check, which interest only, so interest earnings on those funds, and the 14th check, which is a distribution of the excess funds that remain uh, once the school year is, is over and we've incurred all of our expenditures. I'd ask if there's any questions with regards to the 2002 sales tax uh, fund. Justin? Mr. Gidry, the, uh, what's the difference in the professional development budget? Is that we're adding an optional professional development day, or is that, what is that $500,000? I, I think it's sort of a hybrid. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, this year, and, and if there's, if one of the instructional uh, specialists it's my understanding that this year there were, it was too optional and we had budgeted thinking you tended one or the other. But what we ended up having, uh, unlike previous years, is that a lot of our teachers opted to attend both. So there's been, a, there's, there's been, a, there's been an increase in participation. In previous years, they would normally, for the most part, select one out of the two. Uh, with I guess with Common Core and the, and, and the need to you know to uh, get up to speed on that and the, the training that's being to take advantage of the training that's being offered, we're actually seeing them attending both. But uh, I'll defer to I don't know if that's changing next year to where one's mandatory and one's optional. But I know that this year that's what's happened. We've seen them where they're attending both optional days. Yeah. 
there's always been two optional in, uh, days in there, but in, in the past, normally they've attended one of the two, and now we're seeing they're attending both. More, more of them are attending both, not all of them. If there's no other board comments or questions, I would recognize Ms. M Melinda. Thank you. Melinda Mangum, I would like to address the, um, the in-service days. That originally came out of the 1988 tax, and one year supposedly there was not enough money, and they moved it to this at the objection of lots of folks. But the, the, that prof those two professional days were to be taken from the 88 tax. That was the original source of those days. Thank you. Dolphin. Good evening. Rudolph Espinoza, LPAE. Uh, Mr. Guidry, or Mr. Argel, through Mr. Argel. Um, number two, the uh, pay for performance. What, could you explain that a little further? What part of the pay for performance uh, is built into the 2002 tax? Well, uh, prior to the pay for performance, we had step increases. Uh, and those step increases uh, equated to about 13% of the 14% of, of a teacher's salary? That was, that was for the initial raise, 11.65% raise. Just that? Well, and, 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 the, and, and the past, yeah, right. the past uh, step increases. So it equated to about 14%? Yeah. yeah. So that, that's basically what, what this is. And it's not, no longer a pay increase. Uh, it's a pay for performance. Uh, uh, arrangement and we've retained that 14%. Is that correct? Yeah. It's we, the same. It's, it's just the same. It's just a different word for, for the step it's, increases. It's, that instead of calling it step increase, we're no, calling it. No, I understand, it but what, how does that relate to the 2002 tax? If, it, if we give a step increase, how is that built in? How is that coming out or part of that coming out of the 2002 tax? There were previous years when step, where a step increase, I think there were Two years where a step increase is funded by the 2002 tax. Two years? I believe there was two years where we used to have, and we had met on that, where we used to, we, the old system we used to have two pay schedules and all the, it got put in the second one. Then we went in and we did a percentage to, to put it into the new system. But basically that carried forward, but it's the same. It's just called pay for performance now instead of I understand. Step. I, I didn't realize that. So two years, uh, the step increase was paid out of the 2002 tax. For kids. For kids. For teachers, yeah, for teachers only. For those teachers, the classroom teachers that would have qualified, um, I believe it was two years. It's one or two. So if those teachers aren't in the system anymore, how does that work? What's part of the pay scale? It's built into the pay scale. Right. And with the addition, with the potential addition of 24 more teachers, full salaries coming out of the 2002 tax, what would that uh, increase the full paid positions to? The total number. Uh, I'm going to estimate because uh, I believe we're down to the mid 50s uh, prior to that. So I'm going to just take the, I'm going to say 55 and add the 24 to it. Uh, that would be about roughly about 77. It's not an exact figure. I'd, I'd have to actually look at the number, but I think it would be close. Thank you. Anyone else? Patricia? Mr. President, I'm uh, Pat Sonier. Uh, I just have something that I want to read to you about the tax proposition. Uh, when it was originally written in 2001, it was sent to the Secretary of State's office after a September 18th board meeting. There was no administrative plan in that particular ballot. On a, October 24th, the board approved an administrative plan that was written in secret. A lot of us did not know about it. It detailed how we would spend the money from the half cent sales tax. The plan was not placed on the ballot and was never advertised to the voters. The voters approved the half cents tax developed, dedicated to raising classroom teacher pay only. 
All the extra spending of this half cent sales tax was not approved by the voters. Voters were given incomplete information and subsequent boards and administration have not followed the intent of the law. In the budget you're presently discussing, this board has an opportunity to correct the mistake of past boards by awarding the classroom teachers the salary increases approved by the voters. As an example, the voters never approved paying for professional development, lower class size, tutoring, and extra instruction. If you add the cost of these items up, it comes to $5,353,000. Dividing that by the number of classroom teachers that we're paying uh, right now, the extra money, it's 2,282 classroom teachers. So every classroom teacher with that money would make $2,345 more. Y'all, that is a lot of money for a teacher because their salaries are not that high. So think about correcting what boards did wrong in the past by siphoning the money that was supposed to go to the classroom teacher to use for other projects they had that they put in an administrative plan that the public never voted on. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's, let's, let's move on. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Melinda Mangum and um, Deborah Thrower from Apple. We both are here because we sat in the room down the hall in Mr. Guidry's office on this step increase. At one point in time, there was a staggered step increase that sometimes teachers got, sometimes they didn't. The argument was, how do we do this? The central office had a real hard time with it. They agreed. I mean, it was sworn over on everything holy that if we would agree to the $400 step increase for everybody every year, that would be a permanent thing that teachers got, the $400 step increase. And now I'm, I'm not understanding, I'm, I'm confused about how it's become a part of pay for performance. And, and we both worked, I can't tell you the untold hours it spent trying to figure out a way to make this work for teachers. And it's the reason I got involved in this when we had an administrator tell a teacher who didn't get the step increase and was upset that he understood because his teacher, his wife was a teacher and it was her play money too. This is not play money to teachers. This is serious business. Uh, I would just say that uh, under no circumstances would I ever uh, consider committing to a $400 step when in fact th that is something that only the board can make a decision on. I have full respect for that. Uh, so I'm not saying it was my predecessor. I, 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 can, I can say that it was definitely not me. Uh, because okay, I, Gidry, I'm I, sorry, it was not you. I, I you did mention me, but th I'm there's sorry. no way I would ever commit because it, I, I can't honor up. I don't have that responsibility. I don't have that authority. So along those lines, that that's one point. The other point, uh, you know, I've been here eight years, and every one of them, we've we've had similar discussions concerning the, the 2002 sales tax where there's differences of opinion as to the process that took place, as to the dedications that were agreed to. Uh, the bottom line is this, as I see it, and it's just my opinion. Uh, it's not necessarily right or wrong. There, I think a lot of this uh, goes to uh, uh, personal opinions as to how much of the money should go to which dedications. Uh, the right or wrong part is decided was first of all decided by our bonding attorney who steered us through that entire process um, and our external auditors who audit this firm, audits this fund every year and uh, it's tied to the penny every one of those years uh, and they ensure to the legislative auditor that this state that, that every dollar that comes out of this fund is used for the purpose intended. Uh, again, it's not to say right or wrong. I, I just think it's a matter of opinion, personal opinion, as to which dedication should be funded. 
should all of it go to the dedication that relates to an in increase in, in te teacher's wages? Or should it go to some of the other uh, dedications that were included in, in the administrative plan? I think that's, that's the issues that we, we discuss every year. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I want to make it clear that uh, we get audited in a clean bill of health every year uh, based on, which indicates that the funds are being used based on the dedications that, that were approved. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a matter of, again, uh, discounting anything Ms. Mangum has, has, has said, but I just want, basically want, want to clear up the fact that, that there is no doubt that these funds are, are being used in the manner uh, at least consistent with the dedications that were approved by the voters. Okay, if I may, I want to yeah. apologize to Mr. Guidry. I didn't mean that I did the deal with you. It was just your office yes. plate that made me, uh, and it was about the same time around the 2002 tax that the pay for performance was. I can't remember exactly when, but that was a separate thing that was done, and I did not mean you when I no, said that. And, I do apologize. And, 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 I'm not offended. I just, you know, I basically wanted to wanted to state some of the, you know, some of the facts uh, that that are relating to this particular fund because uh, it's it's something that gets discussed at length uh, every year. And 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 there's nothing wrong with the discussions. I have no problems with the discussions. Well, I, I don't have a problem either with the discussion. But uh, I, I would I would I would hope that we would defer th this discussion. I, and I'll always, you know, I'll always recognize you and anyone else who wants to speak but the the idea and, and and believe me personally i think that the the money should go to classroom teachers that's my opinion i've been to a meeting i i, I don't know what the organization is called but i've been to a couple of meetings where the a group that meets from all different facets of the community uh the chamber the the, the lae the uh, apple whatever it is and frankly frankly they couldn't decide they couldn't make a decision on, on exactly what it was. Uh, we have a finance committee, hopefully, be hopefully between the committee that I'm referring to and the finance committee and discussions with Billy, uh, we can, you know, we can make heads or tails of this and come up with a, with a final uh, answer to this. But, I mean, I think there's a better forum in which to discuss it in detail, and that's at that meeting that I keep referring to Rodolfo. I don't know, what's, what's the name of the... The Blue Ribbon Committee, right. I think the Blue Ribbon Committee and or the Finance Committee where you could have in-depth discussion uh, is a better place uh, to get more answers and more time allotted to get those answers. And I, and I understand that. And we have done that every year and I've served on that committee forever. But ultimately, you all have to make the decision. So you need to understand how this all evolved and and you yourself you know you saw the tax that went to yep. the people and you understand how important it is that we do what we said we were going to do and that is our concern and i, I understand think. but i'm going to recognize you man because you did she uh, she held the mic most yeah. of the time oh no no <laughs> i willingly let her have it um <laughs> The only thing I can say is that if I'm sure y'all remember the taxpayers the first time des decided not to vote for it because they weren't convinced, they weren't secure in knowing that what they voted for was where the money was going to go. And the taxpayers felt, because the only people, I don't just talk to teachers and education people, I talk to many people. Um, that they were convinced that this, when they voted for it the, the next time, that when it was up, they knew exactly what it was going for. So I think we need to be very careful and cautious to make sure that we are doing whatever the taxpayers um, truly wanted that money to go for. And I realize the Blue Ribbon Committee is a time to discuss things, but I've been, in the bl I've been there at the Blue Ribbon Committee too, and I know what it's about. I agree with Ms. Mangum. Y'all are the final decision on this. So that's why we're coming to y'all just to remind you that, you know, we want the taxes to stay what they were originally designed for and the public was acknowledging them for. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Billy? Yes, the, uh, 
The last item on the agenda is a review of the uh, budget uh, timeline. Of course, uh, April fifteenth is the, uh, the 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 refers to the meeting that uh, was about to we just about to complete uh, and reflects the drafts of all the non-general fund budgets. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled for this is an old one, uh, May May twelfth, uh, and at that point in time we will we'll discuss the proposed budget for the general fund which uh, also includes uh, our self-insured fund. We'll, be, we'll discuss it uh, at that point in time as well. Uh, and we have a, if, if we do not get through the entire process on that evening, we have optional meetings scheduled for the 19th uh, and 26th of May. Uh, and then we would come back at the beginning of June, present all of the proposed budgets we reviewed this evening as well as the proposed general fund and group health insurance fund proposed budgets and ask the board at that point to approve them to, uh, for them to go forward in the budget adoption process, uh, which would begin on June 4th and 5th with advertisements and then end on June 17th, a uh, special board meeting where the board would actually uh, vote to adopt uh, the, bu the budgets. That, that's the... Uh, budget timeline as it stands now. Justin? Mr. Gidry, which one of these meetings would require action from the board as opposed to uh, presentation of information? Um, it's one of those things that, and, and, and I'm, I'm open to direction uh, um, at any point in time from the board. Uh, we've referred to them or included them all as special board meetings, uh, unlike uh, in previous years, well, I should say unlike previous years other than the, the last, last year where there were budget workshops, uh, w when we're looking at the inventory listing, for example, if, if the board uh, felt that the best way to address it was to basically go line item by line item and take a vote on it, uh, it would allow them to do that. Uh, so. The special board meeting allow, allows the board to take action, uh, but if, there's, if they decide not to, uh, to do so, uh, then that, that's fine too. It just gives us that, that added option that uh, if the board feels that in order to make progress, we might have to break it down into subsets, so to speak, uh, mo you know, motions for various items, it, it allows us to do that. That's, that's, a, that's the reason for uh, including them as special board meetings. You okay with that, Justin? Oh, yeah, okay. That's it. that's it? Yes, sir. Do we have any other comments or questions from members of the board? From members of the public? I'm declare this meeting adjourned. I didn't. I'd like to just use your office as the universal.